I'm James. And I'm Ray. And together we're Death Machines of London and we're here at the bike shed with Kenzo. So we're here with Kenzo. Kenzo um, started off life as a 1977 Honda Goldwing. Um, we actually had it in the workshop. Um, a client had brought it in wanting to do a, a small custom job on it um, and uh, then didn't want to go through with the work. Um, but we decided, look, we'll, we want to buy the bike anyway because that's interesting. Uh, we'd only ever done Guzzi's. Obviously, we work on uh, Ducati a lot. Um, so uh, a Japanese bike, a Honda, was a really interesting proposition for us. But all of uh, Death Machine's bikes uh, have to have a reason for being um, and so we always try and find a story so Air Force uh, the bike that we've uh, that we did previously um, was uh, based on uh, Giovanni Ravelli's biplanes uh, one of the founders of Moguzzi um, and this one we started researching the name Honda um, and we eventually got back um, in the 15th, 16th century uh, to a samurai general with the name Honda now we don't know if they've got any relation whatsoever to the actual Honda Motor Company family, but you know, that's details and we don't worry about that. Um, but also, as well as that story, um, we came across the story of a guy called Kenzo Tada. And Kenzo Tada um, was this pioneering Japanese racer who, uh, who raced on the uh, Isle of Man TT uh, in the 30s. He was the first Japanese citizen to race the Isle of Man TT, and it took him 40 days on sea and train, self-financed to get from Japan to the Isle of Man. Um, and he ended up coming fourth, and he was known as the Indian Rubber Man because he fell off so many times, but just jumped up and got back on the bike and, and kept running. And it was stories like that that really inspired us. And then we also found out that the name Kenzo, because um, there's lots of different ways you can write it in Japanese, but one of the ways that you can write it actually translates as build, create. And so as soon as that, as soon as we found that, it was like, okay, well, this is going to this is going to be called Kenzo um, because it's just meant to be. And um, as we started researching the Samurai General, and we started really getting into Samurai armor. Um, that's where essentially everything came from and everything that you see now before you from the, the design of the, the bodywork is kind of reminiscent of the, the plate work in a, in a piece of armor uh, to the kind of like the, the garments and clothes that they wear underneath and the way it's folded that's represented in the seat uh, to the sword which is represented at the front. Um, all the way down to how aggressive the bike, stand, uh, bike stands. So you've got this incredibly long machine, um, but everything is piled up to the front, so it just looks like it's spoiling for a fight. Um, so we really, uh, we really enjoyed that aspect of, of the build. So we're going to take a closer look at Kenzo. Uh, it's built on a 1977 Honda Goldwing GL1000. We actually already built this once before, um, for um, the Bike Shed show back in 2018. Um, but we kind of rushed it, uh, to be fair, and it was a disaster. Um, it looked good, um, but it didn't function. Um, and, uh, you know, we couldn't really, that, that's not good enough for us. So what we did is after the Bike Shed show, um, we kind of uh, put it under a, under a sheet for a little while, had to think about it, um, and then took the covers off again about um, four months ago and rethought it from the ground up um, from uh, the aesthetics um, all the way through to the engine setup and suspension setup which, which uh, Ray will talk you through in a bit. But I think the, we start, let's start with the obvious stuff first, um, the bodywork. So it's a mixture of um, handmade aluminium panelling, uh, composite work and 3D printing. So we have our, our blade coming over the front. Every, again, everything is about um, references back to the, the Samurai General. So this is kind of like, this is known as the blade at the front, the sword. Um, and then we start heading into the armour. So the, the first cowl kind of like um, goes over the top of that first blade. And then we go back um, over the gooseneck into the main body. 
The main body comprises of uh, the tank unit um, and an overcal which houses the, uh, the speedo. We also have uh, an air grill underneath here which allows us to get um, uh, air out of the, of the venting from the, from the carbs. This piece is composite, this piece is aluminium, the grill is 3D printing. There was no other way uh, with which to manufacture um, that particular item. We then go on to the wings. Uh, again, this was a, a new addition. Um, we felt that the, the body was too simplistic. Uh, we also wanted to continue the lines coming through um, and give it far more purposeful, robust appearance. Um, so we created um, these, uh, these, these winglets um, to form into the body. Um, we also developed our, uh, we took a, our badge, our logo, um, and straightened it all out and created these little emblems for the side of the bike. Um, out of everything on the bike, it's actually my favourite bit. Um, because, I don't know why, it was the, the simplest, silliest little bit of all, but um, I really like how it, it, it feels like an old school um, automotive manufacturer. Moving backwards on the bike, uh, we'll come to some of the rest of the stuff in a moment. Um, we then go into the leather work. What was um, incredibly difficult about this particular design was getting everything to intersect into everything else. Um, so creating the attachment points and the spacing um, and the way that the, the form actually is technically capable of being held together. The seat itself underneath that was CNC'd out of a piece of foam um, in order to give us a very precise shape. Um, I wanted a shape that was kind of had a nice angle to it going down the sides but also swept up into the underside of the tank unit. The leather uh, was created for us by Alma, um, a fantastic leather workshop in London. Um, and it comprises of two different patterns. Again, these patterns are incredibly reminiscent of uh, the tunics worn under samurai armour. Um, so what we've got here is we've got the kind of like the, uh, the neck piece here and then it folds over and folds around and then we, fo we, we, we follow this stitch line uh, which actually hits on the, uh, on the indent of the bodywork for our indicator units. Underneath the seat unit is um, a, uh, a motor gadget um, RFID sensor which is the key. Um, so I'm just going to tap that now and uh, I'll turn everything on. So that's the bike live. An enormous amount of work went into these items. Um, it just simply wasn't enough for us to, you know, go to a catalogue and go, okay, well, what lights can we put on the bike? Um, because what we really wanted to achieve uh, were um, bars of light. We didn't want hot spots. We didn't want to see LEDs. Um, we wanted to create our own lighting setup um, and. That, that began nearly six months of research into trying to find the perfect way to get light to diffuse in a way where no LED hotspots were visible. This led us eventually to a company called Luminate in California and uh, we spoke, to, we, we spoke at, uh, at length with those guys about their technology um, and it was called holographic diffusion film uh, used by NASA um, and some of the most exotic automotive uh, manufacturers in the world. They eventually allowed us to buy a single A4 sheet from them, um, which we have uh, kept in a locker somewhere, uh, which nobody is ever allowed to touch other than do it to produce a final item because uh, it was so expensive. Um, but what it allowed us to achieve was it allowed us to achieve on the running light here, this complete strip of light and then moving over the bike to illuminate the speedo. I'll talk more about the speedo in a moment. But then also on the back, uh, where we have our tail light and brake light and indicators. One of the features of this particular light is that it goes all the way underneath the body and illuminates the entire back of the motorcycle. The indicators, again, use the same technology. Uh, we've used a slightly different lens set up on that to sweep the light round and bleed it out as it comes around. So perhaps we'll talk to the speedo now. So again, it would have been really easy to go to a catalogue and pick a speedo out 
um, or pick any instrumentation out, but you know, why do it if it's easy? Um, and so we decided to create our own. In finding it, again, through the research, uh, looking at the samurai, um, they often had an emblem on their, uh, on their dress somewhere, um, which was kind of uh, their spirit. And we thought that would be a really great idea for the, for the Speedo. And so we eventually found a, a very, very beautiful um, jewellery pot, um, an 18th century Japanese jewellery pot uh, that had a dragon on the top of it. And so we took a casting of that and worked on that and adapted it to our needs and then set it in a series of lenses, again using the same holographic diffusion film that we've used on the rest of the lights um, to be able to illuminate it in a radial way. We then have within those lenses another float uh, a floating disc um, that, uh, uh, where the number board is, is placed and then the handmade pointer goes over the floats over the top of those. The whole system is then tied together uh, with a, a lattice. Uh, we, so we, we've created our own uh, grill pattern which we've used throughout the bike. Um, and that's been uh, made out of a piece of nickel plate using, using photo lithography. That whole unit is brought together in aluminium housing. Um, and compressed and then sandwich and then uh, the way that it works is you have the bezel and you have the uh, the under housing and the whole thing sandwiches together this uh, the top piece of the bodywork so it's completely solid. If I put the lighting on you can see how that illuminates when you're on top of the bike when you're mounted on the bike um, you get an amazingly good view of that um, you just have to glance down and you can see um, very, very clearly uh, what speed you're doing uh, because again, there's, there's no point in making these things if they don't actually function uh, and do their job. Moving slightly down the bike, uh, obviously we've got the petrol cap, again, surrounded by a little ring uh, that just states that this uh, was built by Death Machines for Kenzo Tada. So that's pretty much um, the aesthetics of the bike. I'm gonna hand you over to Ray, uh, who's gonna be able to talk you through the technical setup. Thanks for that, James. <laughs> right, so where do you start uh, taking a 1977 Goldwing and turn it into this? Well, uh, to be honest with you, when we started, we didn't quite know how we were going to do it. We needed wider wheels. We needed to modify the wheelbase. We actually, actually had to build another motorcycle. So from, <clears throat> let's start with the main frame, for example. This is the old shock absorber mount. So can you imagine that whole piece of the bike is missing. So to get around, what we wanted was to build a monoshock rear end. Now, it's a really heavy motorcycle, as you can imagine. And so we decided that mono probably wasn't up to it. So we thought, well, let's try two. So we tried two. We tried really, really um, high pounded springs. Um, every time we just weren't getting the right reaction from the rear suspension. So after the 2018 bike show, we redesigned the complete um, suspension unit and built this cantilever system which I'm pleased to say works very well but in 2018 it wasn't working at all it looked good but it wasn't functional and if it doesn't work we don't want to build it so we had to relace the wheels because we wanted some modern tires on them obviously if you remember those of you who are old enough to know in 77 the biggest tire you could get was probably a 450 tire which is probably this big we wanted something wider, something more impressive, so we had the original um, hubs relays to wider rims. That gave us a problem with the swinging arm, so we redesigned the swinging arm. The original swinging arm was a tubeless steel item. As you can see, this is a boxed item. Um, that gave us more than, more than the um, average headache, as you can imagine. If you come around this side, <coughs> You can see that we've just got in our tyre clearance here and keeping the shaft parallel to the drive, which is important on a shaft drive motorcycle. Um, what else can we say? Um, it's a flat four horizontally opposed um, uh, four cylinder engine. We've rebuilt it, um, but to be honest with you, it didn't need a whole lot of work. Um, it's a credit to uh, Honda on that on that score. We've, uh, we've so we've refreshed it basically. We've re re uh, readjusted the carburation to suit these um, in-house manufactured slash cut um, silencers that we got on it. It sounds awesome and it runs really well. We then finished it all in a, in this satin black and it looks rather fetching. Um, 
so that's the motor. I mean, there's not a lot to tell you about that, apart from it's a really, um, uh, a really robust motor. Um, again, we had to um, put a wide track front end on it, as you can see. Um, so that meant different, um, different yokes. And um, we um, took these Olin's forks from an Aprilia RS factory, um, revalved them and re rebuilt them to take the weight. And then we put these M4 Brembo calipers on. Now, the interesting thing about them, is, apart from the fact that they're very impressive on their own, is that we wanted to have them cable operated. And we, the reason we did that is because we, we designed and manufactured these rather fetching reverse levers. This is our second or third um, version of these. And what it is, it's, uh, it's a cable operated down to a master cylinder under the fuel cell that then, is high, then high pumps hydraulic fluid to the, front, uh, to the front brakes. The reason we did this was we, couldn't, we simply couldn't buy or find anything that we liked. So we thought, well, let's make our own. So we've done that. And as you can see, when, 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 when the uh, brake is operated and then they go completely flush. And that was something we were quite proud of. Okay, one other detail that we'd uh, just like to talk about is this, um, uh, what, if it was a chopper, you'd call it a gooseneck. I'm not sure what you'd call it. Basically, the headstock ended here. And obviously, to get the track and the uh, trail correct and to get a more stable motorcycle, we extended that by about 10 centimetres. So this box section is what can, can only be described as a box uh, gooseneck. So if you imagine that the, the, the uh, steering pivoted there, it now pivots there, so it's a much longer motorcycle than it was before. The other thing that we can, um, that we can add to this is the fact that it's um, been obviously rewired and, and um, the uh, original loom was miles and miles of, um, of wire and connectors, and, but um, back in 77 they didn't have M units and that simplified uh, motorcycle building um, and revolutionised the way you can, what, what you can do with a motorcycle electronically. Um, so it's, it's probably got 15 wires and M unit and uh, that's your lot and it's, um, it's a perfectly functioning, the charging circuit's um, working correctly, it's all um, as it should be. Um, that's enough technical, over to you Mr Hilton. Thank you Mr Petty. Pleasure. Death Machines is kind of built on details and details that probably nobody is ever going to see ever and we get far too obsessed about them and far too worried about them and spend entirely too much time on them and probably too much money as well. Um, but it's what makes us us and it what makes our builds our builds. Um, Ray had mentioned um, the levers. Um, we developed those initially for the Air Force. Um, since then um, they've been refined. Um, and uh, again, we're driving that through a, through a BMW unit, um, which uh, is a far better conversion for our, uh, for our Brembos. Um, but the point of doing that was that we just couldn't find anything out there that we liked. We, so we developed this flow, we developed the idea that you can't see any of the, um, the functioning mechanisms within it. Um, and then we created again more plate work for it. Um, you know, it's just all that's doing is that plate just hides the um, the screw head, the pivot. Um, did we need to do it? No. Um, and it was it inconvenient. Yes. Um, so you know, and, and I think it, when when things become really inconvenient, that's when most people stop. Um, that's actually when we get excited, um, knowing that we're doing something uh, difficult and therefore different. Um, and, and those kinds of details continue on down to the uh, the heads here. We've got a nameplate on there with our Death Machines logo, and then Kenzo, um, reading build create. Going up into more grill work that you probably don't see, which is just inside the uh, the carb plates here. And again, it's about looking with you know incredible detail at all the lines. Do the lines match up? Um, are the are the gaps on either side of the bike exactly the same? If we're out by a couple of millimeters, then we have to take the whole thing apart and understand why we're a couple of millimeters. We've done that. Quite, yeah, we've done that more times than I care to remember. Um, and then, of course, eventually, it's down to okay. Well, what colour do we need to paint it? Now, the first time um, Kenzo was shown um, again a couple of years ago, it was essentially almost, but not quite, black. 
Um, and it, grew, it drew some parallels to, you know, the Batmobile and stuff like that, and that really irritated me quite a lot. Um, and I didn't want to create a Batmobile, I wanted to create something new. Um, and so we knew for this iteration, it needed to be something else. Going back to the original image uh, that started this, uh, this journey of a photograph of a, uh, it was, well, it's a mock-up, obviously, of uh, this samurai general's armor. Um, it was a kind of a brownish titanium kind of leather. Um, and so we worked with our painter, an incredibly talented painter, to mix our own version of a paint. And we must, I think we went through about uh, 15 or 20 uh, different variations of this particular paint color to see how it worked in different lights, uh, see what kind of um, lacquers uh, had an effect on it. And eventually we ended up with this, which we call Titanium Samurai. It's got a little bit of warmth to it. It's, um, it's not silver, it's not red, it's not brown. We're not really sure what it is. Um, but um, we think that this gives the bike a great deal of solidity um, whilst also giving it uh, elegance. I mean, it's a beast of a machine. I mean, it's f***ing huge. Um, and so how do we make something that's so big and so animalistic um, look calmer and more elegant? Um, and so we hope that, um, we hope that this colour uh, does the trick. Um, kind of, we, again, we separated the parts again with matte black, um, so to, to really um, amplify the idea that you're starting here, and then you're going over, and then you're going over, and then you're going through the seat and continuing here, finally, with this part of the belly pan. If we'd coloured the whole thing the same colour, I think it would have been far too heavy, far too oppressive. Um, and so separating the colours with that matte black, I think really helps accentuate um, the kind of like the structural form of, of the bike and certainly accentuates the, uh, the references to the armour. So that's it. Um, you know, there's other bits and pieces that we, I could go on uh, for hours, but uh, you're probably getting very bored of listening to me as I am. Um, a few little other bits, like the, the way that we wrap the handlebars, again, it was just looking at the way that uh, katana swords are, uh, handles are wrapped. Um, actually, it's quite a good way of wrapping a handle because it gives a very natural grip, um, grip form to it. Um, so that worked, that worked well. Um, that's kind of it. That's Kenzo. It's for sale. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, 56,000 Great British Pounds. Uh, we'll see it off. We'll, we'll see it off our hands. Um, and that's it. We're Death Machines of London. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Tony Wilson of uh, Factory Records once said, and he was quoting somebody else, nothing useless can ever be truly beautiful. Um, now, whether or not you think Kenzo's beautiful or not is entirely up to you, uh, but it would definitely not be beautiful if it didn't work. So let's take it outside and uh, start it up. Okay, we've built it, we've talked about it, let's fire it up. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> Sweet, <thank> you. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Bike Share channel. There's loads of amazing videos and posts on there about custom motorcycles and the motorcycle culture.